Good evening. Welcome to a great program tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time of a nice evening. I really appreciate that. Welcome to the first uh, event at the summer term. My name is Angela Beaumont and I'm the Director of Programming at the Jefferson. Just a couple of housekeeping points before we get started. Please help yourself to water, tea and coffee and some snacks. We still have snacks. For the Q&A part of the lecture, we will go around with a microphone, as you know the procedure. Uh, so we have some programs um, lined up for you this week and um, next week and throughout um, the month of August. Tomorrow at 7, Deborah Gross will continue this three-part series with a discussion on the topic, Are Amendments to the Constitution Good or Bad? On Wednesday, July 20th at noon, she and Phil Friedman will conclude this three-part series with a presentation on alternative ways to pick judges. Also on Wednesday at four, there is a digital program where Dr. Philip Payne, Jefferson Scholar in Residence, Dr. Andrew Roth, and Jefferson's Vice President Ben Spagan will be giving a presentation on 1968 and 2022, the seeds of our discontents. The program will be live streamed on Facebook and the video is available on our website the next day. In tonight's lecture, Deborah Gross and Jay Silverblatt will analyze the General Assembly and the series of constitutional amendments that in a dramatic way threaten the independence of our judiciary and threaten the balance of powers among our three branches of government. Debbie Gross, Gross comes to Pennsylvanians for modern courts from over 35 years of private legal practice in federal and state courts all over the country, concentrating on complex commercial lit lit litigation. Ms. Gross teaches at the Villanova University School of Law and received her JD from Boston University School of Law. Jay Silverblatt currently serves as the 128th president of the Pennsylvania Bar Association. He's a partner with the Pittsburgh law firm of Silverblatt Mer Mermelstein. Um, Mr. Silverblatt concentrates his practice in civil litigation with a particular emphasis on lawyers' professional liability matters. He received his JD from the University of Pittsburgh School of Law in 1980. I want to take the time tonight to thank our speakers, our scholars in residence, our board, our staff, ma our members, and of course you, our audience. If you're interested in becoming a Jefferson member, please talk to our staff or take a brochure. Without the support of our members and the Erie community, we would not be here today. Without much further ado, a warm Jefferson welcome to our speakers. Thank you, Angela. So Jay and I are here to speak about threats to the independence of our judiciary. What we thought we would do is Jay will speak first and then I have a PowerPoint that we can talk about what's going on currently in the Pennsylvania legislature with respect to the judiciary. I encourage you to ask questions um, and, and this is a, this is a three-part series and you'll see how they sort of build on each other. So thank you for inviting us and I'm gonna pass this over to Jay. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to Erie. As Debbie said, I'm Jay Silberblatt. I'm very proud to be the 128th president of the Pennsylvania Bar Association. The PBA is the organization that our Pennsylvania Supreme Court has designated as most representative of the lawyers of Pennsylvania. In addition to our many initiatives designed to improve our members' law practices, the PBA promotes access to justice throughout the state and has many programs that protect the most vulnerable and those with the weakest voices. And most importantly for tonight's discussion, we not only advocate for lawyers, we advocate for our judges and often stand up on their behalf since they're ethically prohibited from doing so for themselves. I'm a 1977 graduate of nearby Allegheny College and earned my law degree from the University of Pittsburgh 42 years ago. Whoa. Since then, I've engaged in the private practice of law in Pittsburgh. The bulk of my practice is in our civil courts. 
So that's enough about me. You've been kind enough to give me this platform, and I intend to use it. So buckle in and get ready for a rant. My friend Debbie Gross asked me to talk about threats to an independent judiciary. But before addressing that issue directly, let's consider the backdrop in which our judiciary operates. In my view, the number one threat to an independent judiciary is a lack of accurate, truthful information and a failure of our educational system to instruct our students about our three branches of government and our democratic tradition. Do you think most people understand what it means to have an independent judiciary and why an independent judiciary is essential to a democracy? I think the answer is no. Retired US Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy said, democracy and the principles of the Constitution, the principles of freedom, have to be taught. That's how our heritage is handed down from one generation to the next. It's all our obligations to protect and defend the Constitution. But you cannot preserve what you do not revere. You cannot protect what you do not comprehend. You cannot defend what you do not know. Before we even get to it, the issue of an independent judiciary, do you think our citizens have a commitment to democracy? Sometimes I wonder. When I see flag-waving patriots, I ask myself whether they're even capable of naming our three branches of government, whether they understand why the framers created those three branches, whether they have an appreciation for the delicate balance between those branches and the checks that one has on the others. Democracy is a concept that people only believe in when things are going their way. When your side wins an election, gets a piece of legislation they like through Congress or gets a favorable decision from a judge, then yeah, democracy is great. But when the election is won by the other candidate, when that bill is stalled in committee and when the court case doesn't go your way, well, democracy doesn't seem so good. So I think the answer is no. I don't think enough of our citizens are truly committed to democracy. Democracy to most people means as long as I'm winning, as long as I'm getting what I want, democracy is great. But when one side loses, the blame is often placed on an undemocratic reason, like, oh, the election was rigged. The legislators are in the pockets of special interest groups. The judge is from the other party. I'm afraid that we now live in a society of winners and losers. Take no prisoners. We live in a Ricky Bobby world. Remember that bad movie, Talladega Nights, with Will Ferrell playing a race car driver named Ricky Bobby? His dad was also a race car driver, and his dad told him, if you ain't first, you're last. You got to win always in order to succeed. If you aren't winning, you're losing. Win at all costs, no holds barred. Do whatever you have to do, just win. Cheat, steal, connive, change the rules. Many among us crave instant results. Many in our country lack a commitment to anyone or anything unless it improves their lives now. We've become selfish centered only inwardly, not looking out for our neighbors. Whatever you do, just win for yourself. Meanwhile, there are two other phenomena at work. Many have an overriding tolerance, even a celebration of ignorance. You hear the talking heads on some of the television outlets talking about coastal elites. And that's just a phrase that media types dream up to classify people of intelligence as enemies of the state. If you've got an education, you're not to be trusted or believed. If you're uneducated and inarticulate, you're a patriot. It's another tool to divide us, educated versus uneducated. At the same time, our society is fascinated by the titillating soundbite instead of the in-depth understanding. We're glued to the talking heads of CNN and Fox News. We live in echo chambers 
of people telling us what we want to hear. It's confirmation bias. We believe something and then we seek out confirming information and we ingest it over and over again. Truth takes a back seat to what we want to believe. And the art of reading a newspaper is lost on us. In a newspaper, we get an in-depth report of the facts and an analysis of what they mean. We don't just get a headline or a sound bite. Is there someone or something to blame for these attitudes? I just can't help but wonder about our school curricula. Do our students learn about the Constitution? Maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like our young people today place so much emphasis on social media and sports and celebrity that the social sciences and the humanities get lost. Without the social sciences and humanities, our next generation will never have a commitment to democracy. Heck, they won't even understand what democracy means. Our media outlets feed our unquenchable desire for bad news, angry news, news that promotes conflict and confrontation. Our news outlets have learned that news reporting is no longer journalism, it's entertainment. And what's entertainment? Theater. And what makes good theater? Conflict. The conflicts that are reported by our media outlets polarize left and right. Rarely is there a center or a moderate position. Moderates don't create conflict, so they don't make good theater. Left and right can no longer talk and negotiate and avoid conflict and confrontation. Consider for a moment how our media outlets report about court cases. There's always an angle. There's always black and white, and, and usually if it's worth reporting, the talking heads on the television, well, they think they know more about the facts and the law than the judge and the jury that decided the case. Yeah, they, they know more, even though they weren't in the courtroom when the witnesses testified. They didn't see all of the evidence that was presented. They didn't listen to the lawyer's arguments. And they didn't hear the judge's instructions on the law. But they have an opinion, nonetheless. And they think you ought to have an opinion as well, an opinion that's consistent with theirs. I have to ask, though, how, how can you possibly have an opinion about someone's guilt or innocence unless you were in that jury box for the duration of the trial? Well, I, I guess you can have an opinion. It'll be an uninformed opinion. It'll be an opinion without either legal or factual foundation. It'll be a worthless opinion. But because you're convinced that your opinion is valid, you think you have the right to criticize the judge and the jury. You think you know better. You think those jurors must have harbored prejudices or biases, or the judge was from the wrong political party. You now have lost confidence in our system of justice because you've been told by our media outlets that it's OK for you to disagree with the court's decision. It's right for you to disagree with the court's decision. And consider how judges are identified when the reporters tell us about their decisions. The judges, no matter how long they've been serving on the bench, are identified by their political party. If the decision sounds liberal, well, it will be told it was decided that way because the judge was a Democrat. The decision sounds conservative. Well, we'll be told that it was decided that way because the judge was a Republican. So how can you ever develop confidence in our court system if you're so often told that the decisions result from political influences and that you should believe they got it wrong when you were nowhere near that courtroom? How can you believe in the independence of the judiciary when our judiciary is so often criticized for being political. We're, we're the biggest threat to an independent judiciary. We've met the enemy, and it's us. Our own failure to be committed and our failure to understand how the system works, our willingness to be sucked in by the media outlets and their sound bites, that's the biggest threat. Why all this ranting? Why all this complaining? Why all this negativity? Because this is the climate in which our judges are placed. Is it any wonder that our independent judiciary is in peril? 
Okay, wait a second. Let's go back to the beginning. What do we really mean by an independent judiciary? We want our judges to be above the fray. We want them to be dedicated to one thing, the rule of law, not the political process. We want them to make decisions that are right, not that are popular. We want them to make decisions free of threat, intimidation, or retaliation. We want them to make decisions without fear that a wrong decision will cost them their job or cause harm to their families. We want them to be dedicated to one thing, the law, not to a geographic constituency of voters, not to a political party, not to a donor, not to a governor, not to a president. That's what it means to be truly independent. Our judiciary make up the only truly non-political branch of our government. They must be non-political. They're often the last step on the way to anarchy. And the best example of that is the way in which all those bogus lawsuits were handled following the 2020 election. 63 lawsuits filed, 63 lawsuits dismissed. They were dismissed by Republican judges and Democratic judges. They were dismissed by judges that were elected. They were dismissed by judges that were appointed. Had our judges not been truly independent, our democracy would have died in those 63 courtrooms. While our judiciary is designed to be independent above the political fray, our legislators are products of this flawed and warped political system, our polarized society. They portray themselves as fighters and as winners. And when they get to Harrisburg or get to Washington, they refuse to compromise. They intend to fight and to win at all costs. Because as you remember, if you're not winning, you're losing. If you're not first, you're last. They view everything as a partisan game to be won. And they view the judiciary in the same way. Our legislators do not have an independent, to a com uh, an independent judiciary. They want to win. Their commitment is to winning. Their commitment to winning is far stronger than their commitment to an independent judiciary. How do we know this? Consider the legislation that they propose to create judicial districts in Pennsylvania so that judges would be elected by a geographic constituency. That's completely inconsistent, inconsistent with the notion of an independent judiciary. But it's completely consistent with our legislators' view of the political world. Consider their incessant practice of legislating by constitutional amendment, a practice designed to avoid judicial review and frustrate the checks and balances of our system of government. Consider the legislature's refusal to provide adequate funding to the courts, a failure designed to punish the court for the many decisions they make that did not go as the legislature desired. How can we reverse this dangerous trend? We have to do the hard work and take the long view. Every chance we get, we have to educate our students on the way our democracy works, the way our courts work, and the importance of having an independent judiciary. Let me promote the work of the PBA's Law-Related Education Committee, chaired by Judge Mark Kearney of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. The mission of the PBA's Law-Related Education Committee is well, education, but not the education of lawyers, rather education for the public. Let me take a moment to tell you about one of the very special programs that this committee is spearheading. To do that, I've got to give you a little background, so bear with me. My wife, Lori, works for a wonderful Pittsburgh nonprofit, Film Pittsburgh. The mission of Film Pittsburgh is to advance the work of independent filmmakers as an art form and as an educational tool. Film Pittsburgh has developed and manages a number of independent film festivals in Pittsburgh. And one of the programs that Film Pittsburgh also manages, in fact, the one that my wife Lori directs, 
is its Teen Screen program. Teen Screen has created a library of independent films from around the world that are appealing to high school students and that deal with social justice issues of interest to them. These films involve subjects like genocide, the Holocaust, immigration, and raising one's voice to bring about change. High school teachers are offered an opportunity to add these films to their curricula and are provider, provided teacher guides and background resources that can be used to prepare their students to watch the film. A field trip is then arranged and the students are brought to a movie theater to watch the film, after which they talk with guest lecturers who are familiar with the film and the subject matter. So for example, if the students watched a film about the Holocaust, Teen Screen would arrange to have a survivor at the movie theater to talk about their experiences after the film is shown. So one day, not too long ago, Lori asked me if I knew any lawyers or judges. Silly question, right? Anyway, she had just arranged to add a new film to the teen screen library, a film titled Youth v. Gov, Youth versus Gov. It's a documentary that chronicles a federal lawsuit that was started by a bunch of high school students in Oregon. The lawsuit named the federal government as the defendant and claimed that the government's actions over the last 60 years had contributed to the climate crisis and had thereby infringed on the students' constitutional rights to a clean environment. This case, Juliana versus United States, had wound its way from the trial court in Oregon to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals to the United States Supreme Court and back down again to the trial court where it is now awaiting trial. The film provides a glimpse into the way our civil justice system works and deals with interesting issues about the th our three branches of government and their relationship to one another. In short, the film provides the perfect opportunity for lawyers and judges to go into the classroom and teach a civics lesson about the way our government works and the importance of an independent judiciary. What a great opportunity that just fell into my lap. The PBA has seized on this opportunity and has partnered with Teen Screen. We had a trial run of the film and the program late in the spring, and we're gearing up for the beginning of the fall school year. Our program is virtual, so students can actually watch the film in their schools, in their classrooms, and then lawyers and judges from around the state can zoom in to answer questions and talk about the film after they've watched it. It's a great program, right? Great idea. I've actually brought some written information about Teen Screen and the Youth versus Gov film, if anyone's interested. It's on the table, out in the hallway. The key to the program's success is getting the teachers to call Teen Screen and arrange for a screening in their classroom. With each screening, the students get a visit from a bunch of lawyers and a bunch of judges who can help make sense of our civil justice system and explain the relationship of our three branches of government. One classroom at a time, one showing at a time, we can start to educate our students to understand democracy and the importance of an independent judiciary. Let me touch on one final threat to an independent judiciary. Right now, as we speak, there are people congregating outside Justice Brett Kavanaugh's home. They're protesting. There's nothing wrong with protesting if it's done in a civilized way. But last month, someone showed up there with a gun. A few years ago, someone showed up at New Jersey federal judge Esther Solis's home with a gun, intending to kill her. He knocked on her door and he shot and killed her son when he answered. Of course, there's no place in our society for that kind of violence. And there's also no place in our society for trying to retaliate against a judge because of the decisions made by that judge. Doing those kinds of things is the opposite of wanting an independent judiciary. Doing so is emblematic 
of the Ricky Bobby mentality to win at all costs. In the face of that kind of conduct, we must redouble our efforts to provide security for our judges to assure that they do not feel the effects of that kind of influence. Our judges must remain free of threat and intimidation. They must feel free to make judgments in strict accordance with the facts and the law without regard to outside influences. Our ability to influence judges is in the legal arguments we make in the legal briefs that we submit to the court. Our other ability to influence the judicial process is through the selection of judges at the ballot box. Once selected and once on the bench, we must accept that they are independent and accept that any decision they make that we don't like should not result in us second guessing their independence or integrity. Let's not live in a Ricky Bobby world. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. This was great. Give me a second to line up. Director went back to sleep. You haven't noticed we have a new projector. which is better, but not faster. <laughs> coming up, coming alive. <laughs> Here we go, here's the little window. Like back to the movies when the pictures <laughs> learned walking or, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, Let's wait. See. Push. Go. Great. All set. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Jay. So I can't ad lib like that and speak like that be so beautifully. I have this, this presentation that we have made so you know to many across the state. We completely agree with Jay that education is our our strongest uh, offense and defense to making sure that our democracy survives. We is Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. We have been in existence for over 35 years. I am two years young as its CEO, My, a board member who has probably a much mo longer history with, with uh, PMC is here tonight, so I thank you very much for coming, Phil Friedman. Um, PMC was originally established because there was this crisis in confidence in the judiciary. As you heard, we elect our judges in Pennsylvania, and there had been some scandals about electing judges. Unfortunately, money and political influence take a toll. So PMC was established to support the creation of merit selection for judges. What does that mean? Come Wednesday, you'll find out. But Merit selection does mean many different things, so we, were gonna, we will discuss that. But PMC has evolved beyond just supporting merit selection, and we do a lot of other things. We present uh, judicial um, forums for candidates that are running for election. Odd number of years are elections. It's really important for people to know who they, are elect, who they elect. Turnout in judicial election years in odd number of years are is very small. Presidential election year, nine million voters turned out. Judicial election year in 2021, two million voters. It's a disgrace. We are electing our judges by, you know, 11.11% of the population. We advocate on behalf of judges. We, we do a lot of bail reform, and we do a tremendous amount of civil edu civic education. 
We go to high schools. We work with League of Women Voters. We have Zoom has been a even though the the the, the bright light of the pandemic, I will say, is that we have been able to branch out, literally branch out to library branches across the Commonwealth. We have programs with all across the state about various topics. So, you know, check our website. You're more than welcome to attend. We bring in judges and speakers. We want people to know who judges are. We want them to understand that judges are humans. And we want judges to understand that there are humans out there whose lives they affect. So that's who PMC is. So briefly, we mentioned it, and, I'm not, and I know this audience knows it well. But there are three branches of government. Um, it's established in our U.S. Constitution and in our Pennsylvania State Constitution. The branches are meant to be relatively even so that you have a three-legged stool that may, you know, every once in a while have a little wobbling, but the stool stands. And so we're concerned with the, I'll say, threat to the independence of the judiciary which can happen from the power of the other branches, in particular the legislative branch, getting a little stronger. So um, where is the power of, of in Pennsylvania's Constitution, right? Everybody knows Pennsylvania's Constitution. That's tomorrow's lecture, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. But you know, Article 2 gives the legislative power of the Commonwealth to the General Assembly. Article 4 gives the governor supreme executive power. What does that mean? Article 5 creates a unified judicial system consisting of the Supreme Court, Superior Court, Commonwealth Court, Courts of Common Pleas. Unified judicial system, that's a whole nother topic for another day. But these are our three branches that are established in our Pennsylvania Constitution. We talk about constitutional amendments. This is another quick. I'm going to just do it quickly. We'll go into more detail tomorrow. But number of threats to our constitution, to our independence of the judiciary, have been created most recently through co proposed constitutional amendments. Our constitution in Pennsylvania can be amended a little more easily than the U.S. Constitution. It takes a majority vote of House of the General Assembly of the House and the Senate. It is then published in the newspaper, then in this next consecutive session, has to be a majority vote of the House and Senate, and then it is put on a referendum or a ballot question for you to answer. Many times, the ballot question is unclear. Who voted for the ballot question of, should we extend the age of judges to 75? OK. Who knew that we already had an age limit? on judges when you voted for that. OK, that's pretty good, because most people didn't know. They thought that we were actually creating an age limitation on judges. So the most recent pressing, and I'm going to use the word pressing bill, that was passed in Harrisburg that threatens the constitutional, that, that, is a, that threatens the independence of the judiciary, Jay mentioned. It's House Bill 38. It's taken various names as it passes through the House and Senate. It was previously, I think, House Bill 196. It is a bill to um, divide up by geography how we vote for our, our appellate court judges. Our appellate courts are the Supreme Court, the Superior Court, and the Commonwealth Court. Just briefly, the Supreme Court is our last authority on, on Pennsylvania law. There are seven judges, so that means our state would be divided into seven districts, uh, ge geographic districts. You would still be electing judges for every 10 years, but you in this area would maybe be com combined with, I would bet, Pittsburgh, and you would get to vote for one judge probably every, every 10, every Every 10 years, I think that's how it's worked. Right, I went judge for every 10 years, right. Um, the Superior Court, there's 15 judges. So we would be dividing the state into 15 different districts. And the Commonwealth Court, there are nine judges. So we'd be dividing the court, the Commonwealth into nine districts. So for each court 
in, in the appellate courts, we would be dividing the state into different geographic districts. Let's talk about confusion. Let's talk about concerns about gerrymandered districts. This, this could be a, a, a potential absolute nightmare. What this bill, what the status of this bill is, is that it passed once the House and Senate. I, I like to say in the stealth of the night, because there was no, um, there was no public hearing. There, it was actually passed over July 4th weekend. It was published during the summer. So therefore, it means that all it has to do is go to the House again and Senate again, be passed, and it will be ready to be put on the ballot. So we've been monitoring it. And it's constantly there. This past year, it has been placed on the floor calendar at least two dozen times. And it's placed on the floor calendar for the House and Senate around the time the Supreme Court has decisions that could be impactful, I'll say, okay? Or decisions on matters that are, are, that are of grave public interest. So every time, you know, there's a decision about judicial district, I mean, about voting redistricting, the bill, this House bill, is again placed on the House floor and Senate. Fortunately, there have been, I'll say, legislative action committees that have, have ramped up in, into action when these bills get placed. We, the Philadelphia Bar Association has one, the Pennsylvania Bar Association has one, we have one at PMC, and this bill has created a tremendous amount of interest and outreach to legislators. When I talk to legislators, they say this bill has, re they have received more comments about this bill than any other bill. So as of now, okay, it's, it's quiet, but it is still a real threat. So why is it a threat? So it actually enables a smaller constituency, right, to vote on a judge, because we as an entire state get to vote for a judicial election, and it creates a greater potential for political influence. So what happens is that, and it's actually very interesting because there was like, Illinois, I'm gonna, is one of the few states in our country that has, um, that you elect their appellate court judges by district. And one of the judges, whose name is Judge Kilbride, recently lost his seat in a judicial district because of a decision that he rendered and because of the fundraising and the negative ads that were, that were you know, put out there on TV and, 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 real, and to, to make sure that because of his decision that he rendered, he was, would not be reelected. Well, judges shouldn't have to worry, right, about decisions that they make. Their decisions may be unpopular. But their, their loyalty is not to a business, not to a, a policy, a political party, but their loyalty should be to the rule of law, the Constitution, and precedent. So um, there was also another story I wanted to convey to you in that we spoke to a number of judges who have, are, are, I'll say, um, are retired judges. And they're concerned that by the, having this judicial districting, there would be horse trades, as they say, about who gets to write a decision, knowing that you know you you could come up for election in the next year. Why would you want to write a decision on a potentially um, chart, you know, very uh, energetic or, 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 or uh, potentially challenging topic that you know could could threaten your um, your future in the judiciary. So therefore, you're going to try to make trades among judges. That's not how the judiciary should operate. So we don't want that to, we don't want the judges to have to worry about decisions that they render. Again, it harms the public's confidence in the courts. We 
judges shouldn't have to worry that they're called R or D judges. They shouldn't have to worry that they're going to be subject to oversight from a, a particular in, interest group, particular political group, particular funding. They should be able to write a decision based on the rule of law. So when I, we spoke to the, um, the representative who supported this bill, he said he felt it was important because our state needs the ge geographic diversity. So we decided to look at geographic diversity in terms of where the lawyers are. Well, most lawyers reside, you know, lawyers per, per, um, per uh, citizen, I'll say, most lawyers actually reside in the major cities, right, Allegheny County and Philadelphia County, so that you could have problems finding a lawyer in, in Clinton County, where there are only nine lawyers for, for 30 people, or Center County, 47 lawyers, you know, in 283 people. Um, actually, that's the wrong, this is the better, sorry, that was the wrong graph. There's, Clinton County is one lawyer for 1,298 lawyers. Center County, there's one lawyer for every 555 people. Um, and so you actually could have problems finding lawyers to become judges. The other concern is that the lawyers in the um, bigger counties have more experience sometimes in, in the appellate courts, right? They have more expertise, they have more complicated matters. I'm not denigrating the quality of a lawyer in Center County, in Clinton County, in Lycoming County, but the type of law that they practice may be very different than the type of law practiced in, in bigger counties. A lot of uh, rumors about some of the reasons why the geographic districting bill was proposed is also because they claim that the judiciary, judicial makeup, judiciary makeup of the judges on the bench was mainly Allegheny County and Philadelphia County. But that's actually not true. A number of those judges did start out originally in other counties. Judge Smith, um, well, that's not great. Um, Judge Mundy is from, right, say it again? Tyanesta County. So there are, we, we do have, we have judges that are from different counties, but a lot of them, but she had to, she's, a lot of them have moved to different counties for, for court hearings. She does have an office in her county, but she also has to, you know, travel around the state. So the other issue with respect to this House Bill 38, <coughs> excuse me, that is not even addressed in the bill, is how is it going to be implemented? Are we going to completely wipe out the entire judiciary as it exists currently? Are we going to decide we're going to first attack just the Supreme Court and have a clean slate? Or are we going to decide, okay, if there is a judge from Allegheny County that is up for retention election, will we, decide, will we tell that judge he or she cannot run for retention election because we're going to fill that seat with somebody from another district? So there is no thought process as to how this um, bill would be implemented. And again, with respect to the boundaries, the, the bill says it would be established by the General Assembly with the advice and consent of the Supreme Court. So again, it's, it's just a, a morass of problems. Okay, I did that already. So as I said briefly, the, the legislative history of the bill, it, it passed, it's also passed along party lines, um, and there's, again, no public testimony, no experts, no bar associations were consulted, no lawyers were brought in, it just was, uh, and what's also interesting is that the legislature itself used to be compri comprised of many more attorneys. I can tell you from personal experience, my dad, an attorney, was a member of the legislature in 1964 through 68. The number of attorneys in, this, in our General Assembly has drastically decreased. 
the individual who heads the House Judiciary Committee is not a lawyer. Never been in court, doesn't even understand the legal process. This is what we are facing in Harrisburg, unfortunately. So, um, I touched upon that. Okay. Yes. You know, this whole notion of electing judges. This whole notion of electing judges from um, geographic districts is the way to politicize the judiciary. It makes the candidate, the winning candidate, the winning judge now beholden to that small uh, geographic segment of, of the Commonwealth. And it's just the opposite of what we want our judges to be dedicated to. We want our judges to be dedicated and beholden to one thing, and that's the law and the Constitution of Pennsylvania. We don't want our judges to be beholden to a small segment of the population that elect them. We don't want our judges to risk their job, their position as a judge, with one decision that's deemed by the electorate to be a bad decision. So we have to be on the lookout for this bill uh, to until next um, November. Well, until this November, sorry. But it's actually till, till January. So it could be brought to the General Assembly and passed. We have a majority House and Senate majority Republican that could actually bring it to the House and Senate for a vote. Might pass, although they, we are told they don't have the votes right now. Um, but who knows what happens in sleeping in a, in a, in a um, after, after November, let's say, when a number of leg state legislators are retiring. And then it would potentially be placed on the May ballot. The issue would be May ballot. There are some contested elections. It may bring too many people to the polls. But still, it's, this is still a very concerning proposed constitutional amendment that would seriously threaten the uh, judiciary. The, ne the, the next constitutional amendments that I'm going to talk about have not yet reached the same level of concern. But they're still concern. But they just have been proposed, and they haven't been uh, approved yet by both houses. So House Bill 2141 eliminates the retention election of judges. I'm not saying this is, we, we don't, we ha there hasn't been enough discussion about this to decide whether retention elections are a good or a bad thing. But to immediately eliminate retention elections like this is, is not good. Retention elections are not, are not partisan. When you vote for a judge to be retained, you're voting yes or no as to whether this judge has done a good job. You do not get on the ballot. You do not, the judge is not identified by a party. You are literally identifying, you are just making a decision on a judge based on his or her being a judge and doing their job responsibilities. Many of the bar associations do research and do a retention election um, commission to decide if they give a, a recommend to, to re retain a judge. The other big concern for reten if they get rid of retention elections it, per, in this way, it means that a judge would have to run for re-election and a contested re-election. It means that a judge would have to start campaigning for funding while as a sitting judge. In a retention election, they're not the same kind of monies that are that the judge has to raise. Often bar associations actually have PACs that help pay for retention election campaign, uh, campaign funding. In a contested election, the code of judicial conduct will limit a limits a judge to one year before the time period that the judge can run. If this judge is running against a candidate who is not a judge, that candidate has a lot more time to raise funds, to, to raise campaign finance, finance funds, you know, and the judge who's running now in a contested retention election, every decision will be scrutinized. So 
th this is again a concern, a threat to independence of the judiciary because a judge has to, will have to worry about what decisions they render and how they render them. This bill had a hearing before the House Judiciary Committee on December 13th, 2021. Again, as I, I actually wrote a pen and article, it was the night before Christmas and all through the House. The, the, the hearing was on Zoom. It was, you know, right, nobody knew that these were coming. There were three that they heard. It was a 15 minute Judiciary Committee hearing. The, the House the Judiciary Committee chair would not hear any, any testimony from experts, any, would not take any, any witnesses, just voted on it straight, and it was a straight party line vote. The other bill that was at the same time in December was House Bill 1880. It, had term, it has term limits, limits on appellate court judges. It limits judges to two 10-year terms. So may not necessarily, again, be such a bad thing. We, you know, you don't want to keep judges in their, in their position forever. We have some issues with that on the Supreme Court. But again, it's something that shouldn't just be rammed through. It's something that should be studied, have some testimony, have some hearing. And there is, a, there is a concern, you know, appellate court judges are generalists. It takes some time to understand how, to, to learn their knowledge about all the various topics. It takes, you know, you listen to certain judges and they'll talk about, <coughs> excuse me, how it, they, need, they need this time. The first 10 years is just their beginning of their learning experience. The next 10 years is, is something that's important to them and, they, and how they operate. Also, would discourage qualified candidates from running. I've heard from a number of individuals that if I'm limited to two 10-year terms, you know, it doesn't make any sense for me to give up my practice of law to go pre to become a judge for you know 20 years, and they have to go back into the practice of law. And again, this was before the Judiciary Committee on December 13th. It passed. Uh, hands by, by party line vote and no testimony from bar associations, experts, lawyers. Um, and originally, the only thing that changed was that this bill originally applied only to the Supreme Court and it was amended at the Judiciary Committee to include all appellate court. Finally, the other, um, I'm not sure it's finally, another bill that was recently proposed is House Bill 1910. And this was an interesting proposal. It, it, is, to, it is to change the author, rulemaking authority power. It was to take the power addressing the rules of running the courts, of the rules of running lawyers, the, the court's rulemaking authority, and pass it to the legislature. Um, now, the Supreme Court of the United States um, some of its rulemaking authority is, um, has, has been passed, I'll say, or is, is, comes from the legislature. But it is a, de it's called the Rules Enabling Act. But it is a detailed process explaining how that division of power um, it, it lies. Here, there again, is no detailed process. It's simply that the rulemaking authority that the court has would go to the legislature. It would concern the conduct of the judges, it would concern the rules of evidence, the rules of procedure. It actually also, the court also oversees lawyer, law admission, um, you know, law di lawyer discipline. It would go to the legislature. So, um, all right, I know, I'll skip to the next one. There, most recently, there was House Bill 2660. It has not yet made it to any, any committee vote or any House floor vote. But it is an amendment to allow the General Assembly to create venue rules for civil cases. So again, it's a, it's a rule that has not had any vetting, has not had any testimony. Um, there is concern that 
the intent of this was to address certain specific types of action like med mal and tort liability, but it could impact anything. So, it, and it, therefore it would, it would impact access to justice, right? If you, in a landlord tenant matter, it means, it could mean, it has a potential to mean that the legislature could make a decision as to where is proper venue for the landlord tenant matter. Maybe the landlord is a big corporation. The, the, the legislature could decide to permit venue of a case where the big corporation resides as opposed to where the actual residence residential property would be. So this, this proposed bill just has a tremendous, could have a tremendous impact on many different aspects of the law. Then there's House Bill 2066, which is not a constitutional amendment. Instead, it's a statutory you know, proposal to consolidate the judicial branch operations. It also happened to arise at a time when the court was going, was addressing a redistricting decision. And it suggests, it proposes, not suggests, it proposes to get rid of the operations of the Supreme Court, Superior Court, and Commonwealth Court outside of Harrisburg. Doesn't explain what that means. Does that mean that the clerk's office, the Prothe's office would be disbanded? Does that mean that people who go to the clerk's office would have to go to Harrisburg in order to get assistance or to do filings for cases that you know, arise from, for appeals that would arise matters from Allegheny or from Erie? Would somebody from here have to go to, Har to the Harrisburg to the Judiciary Center? It has not gone anywhere, but it was a creative, I'll say, bill to try to uh, threaten the judiciary. So these are bills that have come before the Pennsylvania General Assembly. But un unfortunately, so you know, Pennsylvania is not alone. And there have been a number of legislative assaults on the courts. And the Brennan Center is a, is a nonprofit out of NYU Law, which has issued a, a recent report about the legislative assault on state courts. Um, they've identified 73 bills in 25 states that have, that have proposed constitutional amendments that threaten the independence of the judiciary. Then outside of legislation, as Jay said, there are budgetary threats. So the judiciary depends on the legislature for funds to run its court system. It goes hat in hand to the, um, to the legislature every year for its budget. It is a humiliating process. If, if you hear, you can hear from former Supreme Court judges who have done this process, they can't get over the lack of respect with which they are treated when they go to ask for money. The, the, the court system gets 1% of the budget, where, but addresses matters that impact more than 1% of the population. Go ahead, Jay. I can see okay, it. more ranting. <laughs> so, so, so this is a foundational problem with our courts in Pennsylvania. Um, our, our, our court system is allegedly a unified judicial system, meaning that Article 5 of our Constitution gives the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania authority over all of our courts. But how are our county courts funded? They're not funded by the Supreme Court. They're not funded by um, the legislature in Harrisburg. They're funded by local taxpayers. So, you know, your court of common pleas here in Erie County, you pay for that. I don't pay for it in Allegheny County. When I pay my taxes in Allegheny County, part of my tax goes to fund the Allegheny County Court of Common Pleas. Well, you know, guess what? If, if, you, if you're a law clerk in Allegheny County, you get paid very differently than you are if you're a law clerk in Erie County. If you're a secretary to a judge in 
Carbon County, you get paid very differently than if you're a secretary to a judge in Dauphin County. There's no uniformity whatsoever. So to say we have a unified judicial district is, is really an illusion. And as a result of that, the Supreme Court, our justices of the Supreme Court, have truly very little influence on what happens at the county level. Sure, there's a set of statewide rules that all courts subscribe to and, and must abide by. But each county court has an opportunity to, to enact their own local rules. And the local rules can sometimes be, well, they can be confusing and they can be uh, somewhat contradictory to the statewide rules. And you know, try as the Supreme Court might, it's hard to change local practice. And so we really have no unified system. If, if we're really going to create a unified system of justice in Pennsylvania, it's got to start at the foundational funding level. And a little bit more of a rant based on what Debbie said. For the last 15 years, our legislature has flat funded the Supreme Court, meaning there's been no increase. But, in but. There was an increase. <laughs> this, year, this year there was a slight increase. Slight increase. But still <laughs> not enough to, to really operate the court at the optimal level that we as citizens deserve. But it's hard because, as Jay mentioned before, judges can't speak in public, right? They can't, they can't go tell their, the, the citizens that we need more money to fund the courts. It's not something that they can do. They have an administrative office of the court of the Pennsylvania courts that has a lobbyist, but the, the courts are not liked by the uh, legislature. So there, even the opinion of the lobbyists and the administrative office of the Pennsylvania courts is not truly respected. So oftentimes it helps when they get um, support from constituents from the local courts that you know that say we need this this, this this these additional funds but the court system is truly dependent on um, the legislature and probably 3 years ago during covid um, there was a serious threat that they were going to cut that they meaning the legislature was going to cut back the court funding which would have actually had to shut, we do have one unified system uh, um, for criminal justice in the, in the court system. And by the threat to cut that back, it would have gotten rid of our unified criminal justice system of, in, in the Pennsylvania because of the limits on the funding. Um, the courts have been creative, I will say, in getting additional funding. Some of them have gotten like MacArthur grants, but courts shouldn't have to do that. They shouldn't have to worry about where their funds are coming from. And then the last threat that I have on my chart, which has been really retouched upon, but it's, it's a very real threat, are the physical threats to the judiciary. I was talking to a judge the other day um, so federal and state judges have very limited security. Federal judges actually have more um, security provided to them than state judges. And uh, as you, I'll say, go down to county and uh, MDJs, there is very little funding of uh, security. You can go sometimes into some courthouses around in, in the magisterial district courts and there is no security, there's no, uh, you know, some courts have, have, have metal detectors, some courts have um, sheriffs, other courts do not. It's, it's very uneven in Pennsylvania. And I was talking to a judge the other day who said he now has to think about how he writes his decisions because he doesn't want to, he, he still will come with, to the same result, but he doesn't want to anger a party or somebody else who could come knocking on his door. That is not what should happen. Our judges should be able to write decisions without worrying about the, the safety of themselves, their family, and their families. So I want to thank you.
Uh, we have time for Q&A. I would love to hear from you, have your thoughts. And Jay would too, okay, so. And I think you were first. I'm Doesn't matter. Thank you. <laughs> well, I very much appreciate comments from both of you, and I find myself agreeing with you about most of most everything you said. I can't think of anything I don't agree with, but I do wonder about uh, in the current situation when we look at the Supreme Court right now, and this has been a big concern. We know that. The Republican Party went out of its way uh, over years and years and years to make sure that they loaded up extremely conservative judges and furthermore, if you'll pardon the expression, jury rigged the, the, what, the selection of judges for the Supreme Court given that they didn't even allow President Obama to submit, uh, submit someone. So given the fact that we do have what seems to be a politicized court. From that standpoint, any suggestions about that? What can we do? So I think about that, and I think it's a lesson for all of us in that, um, you know, when there's a judicial vacancy, it should not be just sat upon. I mean, even in Pennsylvania, there are a number of judicial vacancies that Governor Wolf can fill. I think it's important. You know, there aren't enough judges right now to begin with. There was a study that showed that they haven't changed the number of uh, federal judges in over 20 years, I think it is, despite you know the population and the number population increasing and the number of lawsuits being filed increasing drastically. So. I mean, there is an option to increase the number of judges. That probably would be a, a statutory provision as opposed to a constitutional amendment, because you'll hear from the, that. But I'm not, I, I, I'm not personally one who's gonna, who, who believes that we should be expanding our Supreme Court. I mean, I'll, let, I'll, I'll you know, be honest with you. I think that's a dangerous precedent. And you know, when does that stop? But I am one to say there are the judges are, have a tremendous amount of work, and I'm sure that, that we could use some more judges. Um, but I also do think that the process of, a, of nominating at least federal judges, right, needs to be looked at and reviewed. And, and I would say, too, I share some of your concerns. It's, it's, it becomes harder and harder to defend an independent United States Supreme Court when we see some of the decisions. Um, it, it does feel like the court has become uh, much more politicized. And you know, the, the lesson here is that elections have consequences. The 2016 election had consequences. And you know, depending on what side of the aisle you sit on, you're, you're suffering the consequences of election decisions or the failure to vote in that 2016 election. Uh, I want to go back to Pennsylvania. Um, I've, I've been voting since 1960. I believe I've voted in every election. There's two things that I've noticed about judicial elections. Number one, in Pennsylvania, because of the nature of the state, the geography of the state, we vote not by party for judges, especially Supreme Court, but by geography. So that we who are in Western Pennsylvania, we have a certain feeling for Western Pennsylvania. Uh, we have certain feelings for Philadelphia that are not nice. <laughs> and so when, when the ballot comes out and a, a candidate is from Western Pennsylvania, we don't care which party it is, we vote for them. Now, you'll probably deal with that on Wednesday, but I want the second thing I've noticed is that constitutional amendments, there's something about the, the, about the electorate in this state, maybe it's true nationwide, when a constitutional amendment is proposed on the ballot, by nature, I think I should vote for it. I, I'm, I lose all sense of, 
um, examination of right and wrong, of should I or shouldn't I. It's a crime. I must be, I'm not supposed well, to vote for this. So well, because you think that that constitutional amendment, if it's on the ballot, has been, has been vetted, right? That you think that there's well, been testimony that. and expert, experts, you know, and hearings and public hearings. You would think that, so that way you, you have still some trust. Do you have, do you have any uh, research that would help to verify what I just said? That is, there have been 20 constitutional oh, yes. amendments proposed and oh, yes. 19 of them have passed. 90% of them have yes. passed. Yes, and that's because I think we in the electorate assume that if it gets on the ballot, it's we should vote for that's it. That's correct. So yeah. you have to be really careful what it's, you... It, it's a bad assumption. It is a bad assumption. <laughs> those, those, those proposals get on the ballot because of political um, uh, interests that are... You know, unfortunately, they're not the result of a political give and take. But the voters think they're sacred. Yeah. 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 Well, because we, I mean, a lot of right voters then. still have trust, right? I mean, you still have trust in your government until you, do, until you have reason to believe yeah. that that trust shouldn't be there. So for constitutional amendments, people don't really understand how that can impact them. That's right. I just assume it's... And so, I'm giving tomorrow's speech away, but... But, for example, we just passed a constant, voters voted in favor of a constitutional amendment taking away executive authority, taking away the, the governor's authority to act when there's an emergency. Right. Okay, everybody, it was, it was actually a relatively tight vote of 2 million people, of only 54%, but people won't realize the impact of that until we have another emergency. Then it's too late. And then it's too late, exactly. You just go to the rows here. Then you... I will, my name is Gary Shapira, and I'm, uh, I've practiced law for more than 50 years and was honored a couple of years ago as the chancellor of the bar. But I wanted to pay tribute to our new Bar Association president. Uh, I've worked with Jay over the years, and I can tell you for as long as I can remember, he came to Erie and taught ethics to all of us. So, and, uh, and, and in addition to teaching it, and um, he acted in the, in the movies, in, in the, in, and it was, it was a tremendous learning experience for our young lawyers and some of our senior lawyers who may have been put in a position that they found uh, could be difficult. So we are, we are so blessed in Erie County to have uh, uh, our Bar Association President from Allegheny County and not from Philadelphia County. You, you, you should all know that. And also, I, I want to pay tribute to our judges here in Erie County. We are blessed in the federal courts. We had Judge Weber, Judge Knox, Judge Cohill, and we now have Susan Paradise Baxter, who was extremely competent lawyer. And, um, and Richard Lanzillo, who is uh, the magistrate judge. Also, I speak highly of all of our judges in, in the Erie County Courts. So you should know that we have, um, we have um, a, a very competent uh, uh, group of judges. Also, I, I never want to forget our Supreme, Court Pennsylvania, uh, our Supreme Court Justice from Pennsylvania, uh, Justice Samuel Roberts, who was the uh, the president judge of the Supreme Court, so we we are fortunate here. However, I would like to ask you, Jay, if you could help us. So many times when judges are elected around the state, people will come to me. Get, uh, Kelly, what do you what do you know about the this candidate? And we don't know well enough. We're fortunate, and you're going to hear Phil Friedman speak tomorrow and Wednesday. Phil keeps in contact. But um, 
keep us informed. And you should also know in our bar association, when our local judges are run for election, we do have the judges, I, I beg your pardon, the lawyers um, uh, answer uh, and, and, and answer a survey. So, um, so we are fortunate in this Erie County uh, with the competent lawyers we have and the competent judges we have. Thank you, Gary, for the very kind words. <laughs> it's I true. appreciate that. And, and let me say one thing about uh, statewide there. judicial elections, which, which Gary mentioned. The Pennsylvania Bar Association um, has an, uh, 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 a judicial evaluation commission, and the JEC uh, rates, uh, has a, a very complex interview process, vetting process, for all the candidates across the state who are running for statewide appellate judge. So that's Commonwealth Court, Superior Court, and Supreme Court. They meet with the JEC members, uh, they're vetted, and they're rated. And so before an election, seek out those ratings from uh, at the PBA website from the, from the Judicial Evaluation Commission. Uh, I had a question about uh, Josh Shapiro. He's in and town today, so you know, because I bumped into him. Okay, well, I, I figured you had inside knowledge, and uh, this is not has nothing to do with him running for governor, but as an attorney general, what was the PBA's general view of Josh Shapiro? Shapiro? Um, you know, I don't know that the PBA had a stated policy uh, about Josh Shapiro. Uh, Your personal view? Yeah, you know, my, my personal view was that he's he's done a great job for Pennsylvania. He's got wonderful credentials and qualifications. and uh, He's an advocate you know, for an independent judiciary. Definitely an advocate, and I think he'll make a, a bang-up governor. Very lawyerly. Thank you very much for this, this presentation this evening, first of all. But I'd like to know uh, what your thoughts are on, uh, on lifetime appointments for judges. For example, Supreme Court, many you know, federal positions. Uh, I, I recently did a little research and discovered the life expectancy when the Constitution was ratified was about 40 years. That's right. Yep, that's right. So no one anticipated a Supreme yeah. Court like we have now for decades for into decades. the future. And uh, even, even the 10-year terms we're talking about this evening. We have a president, four years, senator, six years, congressional representatives, two years. Why judges for 10 years? Uh, but, but more importantly, why lifetime appointments at any level? Uh, I think there's, a, there's an inherent uh, drawback to that. I mean, originally, a lifetime appointment was to be free from any kind of right. influence, right? That, right. That, that was truly independent. Um, you know, personally, I've done a lot of research as well, and I would come to agree with you. You know, I also know just from experience that sometimes, you know, having um, new experiences brought to the court, right, you know, new generations helps provide new outlooks and new decisions. Uh, so um, I, I, I can't disagree with you. <laughs> and I think... I, I don't necessarily disagree with you either, but I'll, I'll take the flip side for just a second. I think being a judge is really hard. Uh, it is not easy making decisions on the scale of which we ask our judges to make every day. And I think being an appellate court judge and probably most particularly a Supreme Court justice is has got to be a, a very, very stressful and difficult job. It is not easy. And the more experience you have at something, generally the better you get at it. And so, you know, that that I think is the flip side of the coin. Now, should should judges serve till they're 85, 90? You know, I I think at some point there's some diminishing returns. Uh, I, I, I have one follow-up oh, question. I just want to add one thing. The I want to add one thing. I think it's also interesting because when judges serve longer, um, they themselves develop 
a different kind of relationship, okay? They may disagree with each other on, you know, interpretation of the law, but when they have a longer tenure together, it is a different camaraderie. And that, you know, that is important in, in dispensing justice, is the only thing I can say. Well, I think the camaraderie at the Supreme Court right now is in well, question. Right, uh, I agree with you, but I'm just, uh, you know, I, I have one more follow-up question. Uh, not only that Ms. McCormell has taken the long view on, on judges, very successfully, I might add, uh, is it, is it uh, in, in any, is likely at all that what we're seeing at the state level, you're saying 73 bills in 25 states, that that's a coordinated effort at a higher level than just 25 states randomly coming along with the same ideas at the same time? In other words, yeah. So I can tell you that I... I mean, we, we can't say for sure, right? But I can tell you I saw and circulated to my board, I think, a memo, I, I, I saw a memorandum from like a Republican National Committee fundraising that talked about funding of Supreme Court elections. And there was a focus, you know, it was a federal national memo to focus on particular state court elections. So Thank you. No, it's not on. <laughs> this one works. Jay and Debbie, would you agree with me that these constitutional amendments really attacking the, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania didn't come out of the blue? And it's not the legislature that's doing this, it's the Republican majority in the legislature, and that it's a direct result of the gerrymandering oh, yeah. case, when the legislature gerrymandered the state and created safe Republican districts, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania found that it violated the state constitution, and they created a map which provided for fair representation in this state. And that's what's caused all of these issues at this point in time. Yeah, 100 percent. And it, that the timing happened when the, that, that decision about from the Supreme Court occurred when the when the um, the Supreme Court bench's majority minority also changed. So the combination of the two, there was an election in 2015, 2015, where there were three seats up for election on our Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and that changed the the balance of power. Although I don't. I mean, I don't believe that there's an R judge and a D judge. You should know that. But to change the balance of power and that um, in combination changed the constitutional amendment process in Pennsylvania. And Phil, I, I think Phil has said it much better than I could, uh, but I would add one other set of cases, and those were the election cases that the Supreme Court um, had uh, some decisional authority in. Uh, those those uh, uh, election cases did not go the way the um, the Republicans had hoped they'd go, and I think that was part of the influence as well. Oh. Yeah, but I Ask them together. Um, what we don't do here is just give speeches and not ask questions, but I'm about to do that. There are a lot of people in this room who worked really, really hard through the League of Women Voters or Fair Districts Pennsylvania. And I mean, I, that was a decision I made in 2016. I'm going to do something process-oriented to make a difference rather than political. And I have given up. Don't I've just up. completely given up. Don't give up. I don't, I don't see any prospect of this changing. I mean, maybe our congressional districts are slightly less gerrymandered right now, but our House districts aren't. Well, the our only thing I'll say, House. I think you can't give up because of the gubernatorial election. 
Okay. That is I know that. so crucial. Believe me, I know that. Okay, I mean, you I... have three branches of government. Yeah. I, mean, I get it. Yeah. I know. I know. Our, we all know that the most important thing is the gubernatorial thing, or else this gerrymandered legislature passes anything it wants. You will be a life when you're a sperm. Yeah, we have we have to take the long yeah. view, right. and I, I I'm Trouble sympathetic. <laughs> I'm, I'm sympathetic to your to your feelings, but we, we've got to take the long view and, and make incremental adjustments as as we can. And I would suggest that the uh, United States Senate race is also very very important, very important. I know. And I just and. There are a number of districts in our state that have a potential to change. Um, and so I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but I, there are some, uh, there is a potential to um, have not as strong a uh, majority minority in Pennsylvania in the House and Senate based on the election. There's been a lot of retirements. Um, and so I just like to say to people, you should get people to vote, register to vote. To me, that is, and, and educate people. Talk to people about the importance of voting, the importance of our, of our three branches of government. Go ahead, sorry. I have a couple of things. I wanted to say it's important to get people to register, but more important is to get them out to vote after they register, because yes. a small minority right. of registered right. voters vote, and that's a sin. You're right. Um, also, I would like to applaud you for the efforts you're making on civic education, because in my in my world, that's one of the biggest things. We have a perfect storm of an uneducated yeah. populace, yeah. and therefore they're uncaring because they don't realize how important local elections are, much less federal. They don't care because they don't know. So the education aspect, I think, is crucial. Because we and and the other thing about taking the long view, I totally agree with that. If you're going to take R's and D's, the Republicans have won because they have taken the long view, and they've been masterful at manipulating and go working on goal. And unfortunately, the D's haven't. You know, I've never been. Should I say I've never been a staunch one-party person in my earlier life. But I've been pushed that way, which is regretful. It's not what I truly believe. I like I believe in work voting for the person and not some, you know, one issue or two issue thing because the world is bigger than one or two things. It's composed of a lot of issues. And they all impact each other. Anyway, I just wanted to so applaud you for the civic education. I want to give you a, a, a ray of hope, okay? I taught a basic civics, uh, basic court program to an alternative high school in Philadelphia. These are students who are 18 to 25. They dropped out of high school uh, for some reason, you know, maybe actually had an issue in the court system, but have come back to high school to get their degree. And I brought a, a judge uh, from the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas with me, and we, we had 25 students. And in the beginning, they pretty much weren't interested in what we spoke about. But one of the kids started engaging in a conversation about a case in Georgia, a RICO case that a prosecutor in Georgia brought against a rapper. And the, the entire environment changed. The students were, you know, Engaged, they wanted to know about the court system, learn about it. They realized that you know, it it you know they, that, that that what happened was the words in the rapper's speech implicated him and a number of others in some murders, and you know isn't that free speech? It was a not it just completely changed, and you know they wanted to know about working in the court system and how you get to be a judge, and it was a it was a great experience. So. Just, you just have to figure out a way to engage them. Can I ask one more question? Um, is Pennsylvania still the only state in the country that doesn't statewide fund public defenders? Yes. 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 <clears throat> That's a whole other situation. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll take a couple more questions. Howard, anyone else? 
over there. Okay. Oh, we, we would like you to use the microphone because we have uh, the system is plugged in. Has the PBA taken a uh, formal stand on s some of these legislative activities yes, that have been proposed? Yes, we've, we've taken policy positions on, I believe, all of them uh, to, to oppose them. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Since you brought up about the senator's race, uh, the Democratic candidate for the Senate has advertised that the Republican candidate is a registered voter in New Jersey. Is that true? And what is the residence requirement to run for office in, in Pennsylvania? Uh, I, don't, I know for judge it's a year of residence. <laughs> can't tell you for a congressperson. You don't know whether Dr. Oz is, is a resident of Pennsylvania or not? I've heard that, but I don't. I don't know. I've heard the same thing. He's got a, a huge house in New Jersey, and but my guess is he he probably has some post office box or. Train well, he, or some, he, according to the ad, he moved in with his mother-in-law. Right, his parent. His yeah. Yes, is that is that legal? Yep, he gets his mail there and he declares it his residency. Yeah. It doesn't take much to declare right. yourself a resident of. I see, but it could influence the way we vote. Yes, sure. Obviously. I think it would. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? One more? Oh. I'm no longer in the school system, but I have some friends who still teach uh, government, and um, I guess it's U.S. History 3, which would be Government, sociology, U.S. history three would be basically 17 and 18 year olds, which is the core, 16, 17, 8 year olds is, is the core of the people we want to reach. Um, so with my connect, how, how do I get them? Email me. I'll connect, okay. Connect be us that way. Because. I can remember as a ninth grader learning civics in Pennsylvania. So I did not have geography of Pennsylvania except in school in France in eighth grade. <laughs> but I did have civics, and it isn't taught anymore. And well, what is interesting is the federal system is touched upon, okay? Yeah. But a lot of students don't know about the state system, that it exists. So uh, on the table okay. is some literature about the teen screen program. Please, please, please pick that up. Pass it along to your teacher friends. My wife's business card is there as well. <laughs> Call her incessantly, email her. She and the Pennsylvania Bar Association want nothing more than to you know, flood our high schools with this documentary film and opportunities for lawyers and judges to go into the classrooms. And we have a court basics program that we bring into local judges. So if you, if you find me at high school, I'll find a judge. <laughs> that sounds like a great solution to uh, bring progress into the civics education again. Thank you so much, a warm thank you for our great speakers tonight. Very, very educating. Thank you so much. <laughs>